Good evening, and a special good evening to those downstairs. Good of you to come. You've seen the title. The relevant history can be presented very shortly. I was brought up in a South London home. No connection with the law of any kind. But I was the most privileged of children. Not privileged by money, but I was pri privileged in having excellent parents who knew the difference between forcing and encouraging a lazy, weedy child to work. Privileged in going to a good school where my mother, who was a teacher, was the first teacher. My dad was in the print. And privileged from going thereafter, by going thereafter, to an absolutely first class, direct grant school, which had uh, disproportionate access to the best of universities, to one of which I went, but only because I could go in the slipstream of my brother. And all of this done under the welfare state, which meant that I left university without a penny of debt. And my good fortune continued thereafter because when I decided after a couple of other jobs that I might become a barrister, not thinking of anything else I could do and having a mildly theatrical bent, Lewisham Borough Council paid for my year at bar school. Well, well, privilege heaped on privilege from start to finish. And um, so this launched me, really, by chance onto uh, a career with the greatest of good luck, because also at that time, legal aid was expanding. So if you got into the bar, you could make a living straight away. And again, not live with debt. Luck. A friend of mine, a man called John Leach, realized I had no connections with the law at all. So he created a job for me in the legal department one summer of the Commonwealth Development Corporation so that I could meet some lawyers. And one of the lawyers there, a nice man called Michael Constam, took pity on me and sent me off to the head of chambers that he knew. So I went to the head of chambers. Malcolm Morris, tall, patrician figure, terrified, of course, of the interview that was to come. The door opened. Cigarette? <laughs> Constam says, you're OK. When would you like to start? September? <laughs> And then, uh, so different from today when 30% of aspiring barristers get pupillages and the others have to do something else. Terrible. And, and my good fortune continued thereafter. You have to do six months without work and then you do six months on your feet. And some unwise solicitor um, gave me a brief to defend a rapist for two weeks at the Old Bay. This would count as culpable neglect these days. And I'm not sure that the rapist concerned, who had five years of solitude to con consider the decision, thought it was wise after the event to have chosen me over someone more experienced. But when it came to deciding whether I should become a tenant, the tenants probably thought I might be able to earn a living and share the expenses of a set of chambers. So Malcolm Morris, the patrician nice figure, having become a judge, the new head of chambers, a man who made it to the High Court, but no further, and who was not lamented when he left Chambers or the High Court, welcomed me to Chambers in the following way. The two of you have been taken on in Chambers, uh, Dice. The other man's clearly a much nicer person. <laughs> and then made some remark about the flair on my trousers, which I thought this was the 70s, a little unfair, uh, given that they were at least tailor-made. But this was the same man who a little earlier I had heard in the back of a triumph, herald on a long journey from Norfolk, I think, say to a young woman, a pupil in our chambers, you shouldn't go to the bar, you should be at home bringing up children. So I started my life in a time when there were some real shockers around. Now, what was early days like at the bar? Well, pretty much like brothers-in-law, if you've seen the uh, Ian Carmichael film, and you, you, would, you would rise early, you, very early, in order to get, say, to a county town. It could be as far away as Norwich, either by train or by the old jalopy. You've got to arrive there by 9.30. You might be representing a few people pleading guilty and prosecuting one or two others pleading guilty. Be running up and down the cell steps. Smell of eggs and bacon. I don't think the prisoners ever got that. Um, passing the people you prosecuted as you went down to the people you defended. And then if the High Court judge was sitting, it was a wonderful sense of belonging, the county set where the High Sheriff might have lunch and you'd be invited. You might go in the judicial Daimler or the Austin Princess with the High Court judge for lunch at his lodgings. 
You might have a little trial, last a couple of days, two nights or one night in one of those sticky floor two-star commercial travellers' hotels, back to chambers, and the same night, pick up a few more briefs, maybe in a civil case, maybe matrimonial, and off to court the following day. And so it was both exciting, you sensed you belonged to something, and you learnt very, very quickly. Whether it was a question of learning at the expense of our clients is a question perhaps I'd rather not answer. <laughs> but my good luck uh, continued. With this expanse of legal aid, um, some chambers were on the greedy side, and so they'd send their men you know, to uh, Ilford in the morning and then out to, where's on the other side of town, Wimbledon in the afternoon. And it was fine if it worked, but of course, if the man missed the train or the case overran, they were a bit embarrassed. And so one day, the chambers next door who did this, our, our chambers didn't do this. We had chambers with an old, not a traditional clerk, Arthur Hathaway, and his number two, George Hale. They didn't do this. Next door got into difficulty, and although I wasn't on the Metropolitan Police approved list, I was sent to Barking to do a football case, I think it was. And that actually resulted in many repeat hearings week by week for this football case, football hooligan case. And the solicitor concerned, a very powerful solicitor called Clive Winston in the Metropolitan Police uh, Solicitor's Department, repaid our loyalty by, as it were, promoting me first to um, picketing cases, one of which actually I went to the House of Lords behind a Queen's Council, of course, another of which in which I prosecuted somebody who I think sits on the front bench of one side or other for the House just at the moment. And then from picketing cases, it was sex cases, um, dirty books. Didn't like dirty books very much. Um, in fact, it was extremely boring. But it did give me a chance to be against John Mortimer, the author of Rumpole of the Bailey. And he, um, he, lecture, he presented the case always in the same way. He certainly never read the books. And if he had them in front of the jury, he pointedly read them upside down with his glasses at a sort of angle like that and uh, gave the jury his freedom of speech speech. They always acquitted no triumphs for me. And then the next thing that happened was that Clive Winston promoted me again, it being but a short hop, as it were, from dirty books to prostitutes. And um, uh, vice was taken very seriously in those days, and again, they, they took in leading counsel, Queen's counsel. And so I, had, uh, I was led by both Michael Havers, who was to become the Attorney General and Lord Chancellor, uh, and he was helpful in my career. And I was also led by a chap called John Marriage. Let me tell you a little story about one of the cases uh, he led me in all to a point. Uh, the case concerned was the Nina Spitzer Escort Agency. And Nina Spitzer's very nice girls would only go and engage in conversation with the nicest of gentlemen at the theatre. And, and of course they didn't go anywhere else. Well, maybe. Um, but in those days, people were a little bit more naive about escort agencies. And in this case, there were four women defendants. And it happened, the case happened in a court opposite the back door of Harrods. And uh, the judge was a very nice judge who'd been in our chambers called Munro Dobis. And uh, he, he was a bit of a smoker. He liked his morning fag, or a couple, I think. And so we had quite a break about 11.45 when John Marriage this may have been a problem for him, and I would pop across to the basement bar of Harrods and down one, and I have to confess, occasionally two double G&Ts before returning. That was what life was like. This is, I suppose, in the late 70s, and we seem to get away with it. But the funnier part of this story comes at the end. John Marriage was a really powerful advocate. Um, Mesmerising, had an animal presence for juries, I thought. But he was also a bit of a toff. I mean, a slightly rakish toff but he was a horse race trainer, the relevance of which we'll come to in just a second. We came towards the end of the case, and of course the four women defendants could, and indeed did, give evidence. Nina Spitzer herself was a, a perfect target. He destroyed her, made her utterly ridiculous, gone. Number two, there were a lot of documents against number two, the principal receptionist, and documents are what make for cross-examination. She too, gone. Number three, John said to me, very sorry, he had soft R's, very sorry, he said, I've got a horse race betting levy bull meeting tomorrow, but you can cross-examine number three. So I tried to cross-examine number three, against whom there were no documents. 
and I was utterly hopeless, completely useless. John came back for number four, and number four he found quite attractive. I mean, to question. And so he, he not only destroyed her forensically, but he kept her in the witness box maybe for a bit too long. Uh, he then gave his closing speech, and he had another meeting which he had to go to. So I was on my own. Closing speeches by the defence, well, you can imagine. Counsel for number three, the one I'd cross-examined, said nice things about her, but whenever he got a spare second, mocked me, ridiculed me, told the jury quite how useless I'd been. I rather agreed with him, actually. And then he had another go. Um, the jury went out and they came back, and of course the inevitable was going to be guilty, guilty, not guilty, my final embarrassment, and guilty. Bless the jury. Guilty, 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 and not guilty. And a proper interpretation of that is that <laughs> the jury weren't going to see me bullied, nor were they going to see the fourth defendant over-bullied by John. I told John about it. He was absolutely thrilled. He thought it was the best result you could have. And he again, incidentally, helped me in another way. One day at lunch, I'm afraid, inevitably, in a wine bar, he said to me, something from the Lord Chancellor's Department wants people who can be assistant recorders, that's part-time judges, just ring this number and say that you'll do. Marriage said so. So I rang the number, and at really quite an early age, I was straight away on the assistant recorders course. These days, huge competition, application forms that take a week to fill in. What luck I did have. Let's say something now about battle, because I think it's quite important. The adversarial system means that the <coughs> advocate is in battle, day in, day out, on behalf of his client, and it's a stylized battle in which the barrister should not lose points personally. If he read his papers and knows the law, knows his case, in court, he shouldn't come unstuck. But is it actually possible to separate out the business of battle in court from the business outside? And the answer is... Not really. Not only may you find yourself outside court in personal difficulties with your opponents over, uh, if it's a civil case, over settlement where you have to have your real personality and be in real fight, but you can also find problems in, for example, multi-handed defence cases in the criminal world. But my learning of the sort of place in which I was working came in a rather different way, with two judges who decided that they would ridicule me for my appalling mitigation on behalf of criminal defendants. The first, also from my uh, old chambers, that's three of them now, he also had got no further than the High Court bench. I won't name him for reasons that will follow. And he was sitting in Lewis, uh, a place that always seems about 30 years out of date, Lewis in Sussex. Um, nice for all that, lovely panelled rooms. And I was mitigating on behalf of a woman of very limited ability who... Um, I had committed quite a serious offence, and I had in my possession a document, a social services document or a probation report, that I thought fleshed out uh, and explained the real limitations of intelligence that she had, and I made it available to the judge, who was kind enough to observe in his sentencing remarks that no act has possibly done more harm to the interest of this woman than counsel advancing this particular document. Well, thank you very much, judge. I was, I was very clearly acting conscientiously, even if ill-advisedly, and I don't think I was. And, of course, I learnt from that experience the start of the insomnia, of uh, the anxiety of being a barrister. The next time it happened, it was, a per, uh, it was by, with a judge of rather smaller stature in various ways, known for his inclination to try and harm barristers. And I was appearing for three blokes, all of whom had really to go to the the prison because their offences of dishonesty were such, even though they were good character, nice blokes. I mitigated for all three of them, and this judge intoned at the beginning of his sentencing remarks, when I started reading these papers this morning, I thought you could all have a suspended sentence. Having heard Mr Nice, I very nearly decided to send you straight inside. <laughs> This is completely, a completely wicked act of cruelty by this man. But now I learnt. He was going to have to apologise to me. Because once I put the interests of my clients, I have to say the post-hearing conference with my clients was a little uncomfortable, but never mind. Um, 
he was going to have to apologize to me, and he did. And from then on, I realized that there is a nasty jungle, the law, with some pretty unpleasant animals and beasts in it. So we'll come back to that again a little later. A few cases in real quick order. All of them, I think, nearly about death. As you land up doing a lot of cases about death, each has a message. First, there was a case involving a railwayman found dead on the tracks at Croydon on a hot summer's day. His head was very near one train, but it was quite... And there was another train that might have hit him, and, and then there was a third train that couldn't have been involved. And it wasn't clear from the inquiry whether he died of natural causes or whether he was hit. So the widow couldn't recover damages. My solicitor on this occasion, uh, I tried to keep the case alive. My solicitor, I'm afraid, was having personal difficulties and the case sort of kept dying. So we all got sacked. Next counsel, a uh, next solicitor and counsel did what we had not done. We'd done reasonable inquiries. They went to the door of the driver of the train that the inquiry revealed that no, couldn't be involved. Knock, knock, knock. I appear on behalf of the widow so-and-so. The man says, thank God you've called. I've been waiting all these years to confess. Yes, my train killed him. The widow recovered. Message, ask the unaskable questions, do the unbelievable. Never take anything for granted. I, I took Silk, became a QC in 1990, and uh, there's another case that I must tell you about, which is uh, perhaps um, really a bit more significant in its own way. It's a case called Barrett and the Ministry of Defence. Barrett was a, a naval rating, and he died on his 30th birthday at a base in Norway called Bardufoss. Uh, the judge, a very nice judge called Phelan, found that there was a culture of really indescribable alcohol on this base, engaged in by everyone, absolutely deplorable. And poor, uh, poor Barrett, who died on his 30th birthday, expressed to his uh, wife, mother of his young son, Liam, concern at what they might do to him that night, pouring wine, booze down his neck, um, throwing him in the snow, all possibilities that emerged. The Ministry of Defence tried to keep all their inquiries from us, but failed. We had a kindly judge at an interlocutory hearing, Popperwell, who ordered them to hand over their inquiry. The case went really well. We called. Uh, I had a terrific junior, Sy Llewellyn, uh, now a very senior judge, who, who knew the law, which is always a good thing with me around. And um, uh, we, had, we called the chief petty officer from the other side, dangerous thing to do, uh, but he gave evidence of what a ghastly, drunken state this base was. Um, and we won at first instance. We were against a chap called Leveson, he of the Leveson Inquiry, and he did the case extremely well. And he'd made a, an offer and a payment into court in a certain, of a clever amount of money, somewhere between 50% and 66% of the reasonable value of the claim. They went to the Court of Appeal. And in the Court of Appeal, presided over by uh, an expert in defamation, sitting with a commercial lawyer, a judge, and one man who probably did know a bit about the common law on personal injury, they, I'm afraid, decided to reverse the trial judge's findings, which was that this man was only 25% to blame, to finding that he was 66% to blame. Um, I can't speak, of course, for Anthony Sice well now because uh, he's a judge, so he, his opinions have to remain silent. I can speak for mine, though. And uh, amongst other things that <clears throat> the judge concerned, who gave the judgment, he came into court and he brought out a book called The Wooden World, a book about life in the Navy in the Georgian times. Everyone knew that drink was a factor in crime, most often the chief factor. It was virtually impossible to do much about it, he said. And then he said, Admiral Smith, that's the Georgian admiral, divisional system went as far as most officers thought it reasonable or possible to go. The midshipmen of the watch were there to see all men they find far gone in drink put into their hammocks. 
which is what had happened with my bloke. Unfortunately, the watch over him, not my bloke, the deceased, um, the watch over him had been inadequate and he died on his vomit. But here was, was it? I don't know. To misquote, was this an, to misquote, misquote Churchill? Was this an example of rum, the establishment of the lash? The lash of the Court of Appeal? The consequence of the reversal of their findings of liability, that most of it fell on this man who'd written in advance to his wife, I don't know what they're going to do to me. The result of that was, because Leveson had paid the sum of money into court, the damages she got were completely eliminated by the costs she had to pay. She, I can't remember what her job was. I've tried to find her in the last couple of days to see how she and her son have done. Um, got nothing. And yet, Anthony Sice Llewellyn and I did not worry that much about this case. We didn't lose that much sleep. We advised the plaintiff, Mrs. Barrett, conscientiously that we thought she should get, that her late husband was less to blame than the Ministry of Defence were. We advised her of the risks. She took the risks. And when it was all over, she was utterly dignified and, I hope I'm safe in saying this, she explained she was not going to let her son Liam grow up thinking that she had ever conceded on his behalf in any way that his father was the author of his own misfortune. And her, her case, it seems to me, shows a really important point, obvious, but always worth stating, that there's more to what happens in court than the passage of money from pocket to pocket. And there is more by way of justice to be found frequently in the thinking of ordinary folk who are not lawyers than those who feel it appropriate to quote from a book about the Georgian Navy. I found myself sitting next to that judge at a memorial service the other day. He didn't know who I was, and I didn't think it appropriate to tell him. Um, a couple of other uh, very quick cases that I can perhaps tell you about. Um, one, <laughs> a couple of funny cases in a way, really. There was one case, um, it's the, the most interesting murder case I've ever done. A fascinating case. I could spend a whole lecture exploring it. It was a real whodunit. But the critical piece of evidence came from the forensic scientist. And the forensic scientist for the prosecution in this case uh, produced a report which was pretty neutral. Our scientist that I was defending, the defence uh, scientist, sort of agreed with him, and the two of them effectively let the evidence go in pretty well unchallenged. There's a lot of evidence against my chap and he was inevitably convicted. So he sacked me. Why not? Next counsel did that which I had not done, um, and which probably wasn't the industry standard, to use a colloquial expression of the day, and might be, I suppose, more likely the standard today. And he didn't just rely on the two scientists. He sent for the working documents of the forensic scientist for the crown. And in those documents, it was found, and funnily enough, the case came back to me so that I could have another go. I don't know why, quite, but I did. But in those documents, one of the intimate swabs taken from the deceased woman who had been butchered to death, on one of the swabs, were found three semen heads. Now, that's a quantity of seminal deposit too small to do anything with. And my guess has always been that that prosecution scientist wasn't acting of bad faith when he didn't mention this. He probably knew that A, it could never be matched by DNA, and B, it was in any event too small, too insignificant to be evidence adverse to anyone. But what he'd overlooked was that in the defence case, this would actually be favourable to the defendant because it would be the indication that somebody else could have been involved with this most unfortunate woman. And what's, I think, additionally sad about 
this particular case is that in the Court of Appeal, where the forensic scientist, who I believe personally was not acting in bad faith, was cross-examined, it was the end of his career. He never worked again and never recover from the experience. And you see quite how savage our system can be, however elegant it may look. At the retrial, uh, there was no match of DNA, but the mere existence of the three semen heads led to the man being acquitted, and we have never heard, finally, who committed the killing, although I have a pretty good opinion. But I can't tell you. Finally, there was a rather another strange. So, what's what's the lesson there? The lesson there is leave no stone unturned. Um, another case, very briefly, a fascinating murder case where I was prosecuting. Another strong case. He would have been convicted in any case, I think. But what was so interesting was that we had absolutely no motive for why this chap would kill his best friend, as he did, shot him in the back on the boat crossing the Medway River. Why did he do it? Well, we had a little notebook which ha had a list of things in it which looked, if you decoded it, like a plan. It was actually headed D-Day, plan to kill this man. But it still made no sense. None whatsoever. But rashly or otherwise, I decided to rely on the notebook when I opened the case to the jury. And then when I did, my opponents thought I was completely nuts to rely on this. But I did. I probably was nuts. Partway through the trial, we heard a little bit more evidence. But my police inspector, a very senior inspector, and very, very rightly said, don't change tack now. Don't change tack. It'll look weak in the jury. He was quite right. But it so happened that this little piece of evidence that came out, or came available to us partway through the trial, became available to us in the very last witness called by the defence. Called by the defence for a very small purpose, something to do with an issue of timing. And this chap, the, the, the sort of friend of the defendant, was a witness I was able to ask a couple of questions. I said, the defendant's a delivery driver of computer parts, isn't he? Yes. But, I suggested, because of what I'd heard, but he also had another job, or so he said. And the witness clearly knew exactly what I was driving at by the words, so he said, confirmed it, and established that when going out to deliver computer parts, the defendant would often say that he was going out in his job as a secret agent for MI6. He lived a complete fantasy world. And here's what's funny. We'd missed the evidence, which was literally in our hands from the word go. The pocketbook. It wasn't the sort of book you can buy for 30p in Smith's. It was a book he, a grown man, had carefully constructed himself to resemble something like a police officer's notebook. Why would anyone do that? Unless, indeed, he had an obsession of the kind that must have driven him entirely out of fantasy to commit the perfect murder of his friend. I don't know quite what the lesson of that case is, but there's one there somewhere. In um, 1998, a bit bored with what I was doing, I went off to Holland to become a prosecutor for the United Nations at the Yugoslav Tribunal. And my English practice went to sleep. I did not go there to save the world. I went there because the work was interesting. And, and since then, I've been very fortunate. Really, my career has changed. I came back from there in 2006. And since then, my work has been pretty well involved with international conflicts on all sides and also being able to uh, represent groups like North Korea and Burma and Iran who can't get representation. So I've been really fortunate in the way that the career has planned out for me. And indeed, that's, that's probably what brings me here to be able to do this job. What was it that I was able to take from my experience in England to the international tribunals? 
Well, I think a few things. First of all, uh, making war crimes cases is extremely hard work. And by the time I was doing the Milosevic case, it was um, you know, seven days a week, as many hours as you could manage. And I couldn't care less about that. I really liked it because I'd done it at the bar for 30 years or 28 years or something. By then, uh, no problem at all. The second thing, which is, comes back to that business of having to be able to fight and learning throughout your career that it's a tough and nasty world. The UN uh, is a pretty unpleasant institution in some ways, and its court was highly political. And you would find yourself not infrequently facing the most terrible personal conflicts. You didn't want these as a lawyer. They came your way. You had to be able to deal with them. You had to be able to detach yourself from the law and go out and fight. You, you had the advantage of being, I had the advantage of being an English barrister. We're all self-employed, which means that we know one error and our career can be gone. One suspicion that you've acted compliant with pressure of an improper kind and that's the end of your future. But that, in combination with the willingness that the weedy child had turned, uh, it, it had, had discovered that he could, he could engage in battle, that, I think, was pretty helpful to me. Third... Um, you have to be able to face the impossible task, the one we didn't face in the Croydon, for example, case. You have to face the impossibility and go out and deal with it. You have to think the unthinkable. And perhaps finally, in my case, uh, and in some somewhat unclear way, you have to remember that there is something other than the law that is the God to be served. Sometimes there can be a bigger interest. It doesn't much matter about the law. You simply got out, get out there and serve it. And I suspect without the 27 years of being at the bar, I wouldn't have been able to do that which was also necessary because uh, it was a very large team I was working with. Um, you have to get in there in the morning before everybody else, of course, with a smile on your face, and you have to leave in the evening with a smile on your face, whatever's happened. And I don't think... And the bar, that's easy. <laughs> you always have to have a smile on your face for your clients, not to mislead them into things, but you have to be positive. So I think that's what I was able to take. The trial team I led could sometimes be as large as 100 people, not all working in uh, exclusively for this case and of different disciplines. And I think one of my more successful management decisions was a day after we had a really bad result of some kind from the bench, you know, they excluded stacks of evidence or cut half our case to pieces. So we had the usual morning meeting. I had, I had daily quick morning meetings where everybody could turn up if they wanted to, contribute and then get on with the work. And there they were all sitting around the table, perhaps 20 lawyers, long faces, gloomy, glum. So I addressed them as follows, you lucky lawyers. You are the luckiest lawyers in the world glum faces. Your colleagues at home would all give parts of their anatomy to be sitting where you are. Long faces. You're no good at anything. None of you could do a proper job. You, you couldn't farm. You couldn't make anything. And you're lucky to be fiddling around with other people's problems as a lawyer. Long faces. Your function in life is to solve problems. Dim appreciation of what I was talking about. Dim. The judges, so your job satisfaction, I said, is in solving problems. And the judges yesterday made the problem that much more difficult that your job satisfaction is now much, much greater. <laughs> they thought I was mad. <laughs> but I wasn't. The proper lawyer is never happier than when he's in the middle of something difficult that is uncertain of result. And let me give you an, uh, one example of that. Um, there was a very famous massacre in Kosovo at a town or village called Rachak. And the prosecution said that this was a massacre, and it was important because it was the massacre that allowed NATO to come in and bomb Kosovo, not bomb Kosovo, bomb Serbia, um, kick the Serbs out, and ultimately for Kosovo to achieve its independence. Critical event. The Serbs said it wasn't a massacre at all, that this was simply the Serb forces fighting the terrorist KLA, and that all these people dressed in civilian clothes were, in fact, terrorists. Uh, we had reasonably good evidence. Um, there, there, there they are, 
uh, some of the bodies in, in Ratchak. And there they are in the culture dome or something afterwards where they were lined up. And there's another picture. And we had quite good evidence that it was a massacre. And then one day in the middle of the defense case, we discovered we had a huge amount of evidence favorable to the Serbs. Lots of witness statements saying that all these people here who you see dead were in fact KLA terrorists who'd been dressed up in um, civilian clothes. It was quite interesting that my team, certainly the investigators, were anxious. They were so embarrassed by what they'd done. They said, oh, can't we drop, can't we drop the Ratchak count altogether? Of course not. Here was a real problem. And just as in any other legal problem, you have to face it. So what do we do? We were lucky enough to get some time from the judges. Uh, and we, we, we went down to Kosovo, of course, and conducted an investigation. The policeman who'd taken the uh, witness statements from all these people saying that they were, not these people, but from other people saying these people were all terrorists, was a man called Yashevitz. Now, we, there was a little bit of independent evidence from either Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, nothing to do with us that he was prone to use torture to extract confessions from people in a police station where occasionally, unfortunately, you could stand on this floor and the people would be falling out of the window above. So there was a little bit of evidence against him, but that wasn't going to be enough. We spoke to the witnesses, and they did tend to say, well, yes, uh, that's not my signature, or this statement was beaten out of me. But you could say, well, they might say that, might they? We had to do something else. And so we just treated this like an ordinary English criminal case, treating Yashevitz as a possible crook. We took all the witness statements, we analysed them, we scheduled them, what they said, what they didn't say. Now, in Ratchak, there was a homogeneous collection of people of which one could reasonably say, this month, many are going to be KLA, this many are going to be decent civilians. And by chance, they were split and half of them went to House A, and half of them went to House B. The Serbs tried to drive the occupants of both houses into the ravine, which you saw, which is where they were all killed. But in fact, only House A went there, and House B had the good fortune to escape. The witness statements were taken before this happened, and Yashevic had done that which so many crooks do. He'd forgotten that if he was going to make up statements about the people in House A saying they were all terrorists, the ones who'd been killed, he had to do the same thing for all the people in House B. Not a word. This was fraudulent evidence. And as a result of not doing what the investigators wanted, run away from it, we confronted it, and the happy result was we had much stronger evidence, actually, about Ratchak as a massacre. It, it will still be the subject of contention by Serbs, but the evidence is pretty satisfactory that a massacre is exactly what it was. The second example from uh, the, the Milosevic case I'm going to tell you about is something in a way which I think is one of the best, uh, the best, that's, that's the gully where they were all killed, I'm afraid. Let's see, bit, where do we go next? We'll come back to him. Yes. The, the, the next thing I'm going to tell you about is in a way, I think one of the best things I did uh, in the Milosevic trial, and it concerned a, a terrible video we had seen in one earlier lecture taken by a group called the Scorpions and showing their killing of uh, six very young chaps from Srebrenica. The film was extremely valuable because the Scorpion unit answered to the Serbs in Serbia. It was a Serbian unit. And Milosevic had been trying to say throughout that Serbia wasn't involved in this conflict. And yet here was a unit answerable to his government that was responsible for killing people from Srebrenica. Very valuable evidence. We didn't get it in, uh, early enough as a video to use in our case, and it was in the course of the defence case, and not before, that the provider of the video was made safe, given a secure house or a change of uh, identity or something like that, and we could use it. And then we did have the good fortune that it turned up in the evidence of the defence evidence of this man, Obrad Stavanovich, General Obrad. Stevanovich. He'd been a police general. Now, he gave evidence for 15 days 
And I think my cross-examination was about five days, starting on about day eight. He, there was a lot he covered, but I knew I needed to get the video in somehow through him. I also knew that as soon as I put in the video, if I did, it was so explosive in its effect that he would object or counsel appearing for Milosevic would object or the judges who often showed themselves to be a little timid would, would get in my way. I also knew that if I made it clear to any of the people in my office, in particular the chief prosecutor, Mrs Del Ponte, uh, that she'd probably either mess it up or even try and stop me because there were some very curious influences going on there that were all entirely favourable to Serbia. You couldn't trust the office. So what did I do? Well, I did a number of things, but first of all, I took the film, which was an hour and three quarters long, and reduced the bit I actually wanted to about a minute. I also took some still photographs. But I always found more interesting is what, is what I actually did to him, the witness. Because I knew I would need to buy some time when I came swapping topics to mislead him when I came to the film. What I needed to do was to generate the impression that he was in some way helping us. So, at a very early stage, I said to him, you've taken the solemn declaration. Are you prepared to help the chamber if I give you that opportunity a little later? Or are you just here to help the accused? So he, well, he couldn't answer that question any other way, could he? He had to say, oh, I'm here to answer questions put by both. I'm here to help you, basically. So over the next couple of days, I asked him a few more questions. Can you help me over this? Can you help me over that? Can you arrange to get these documents from Belgrade? It was probably entirely insincere of me. But I needed to create for the court, for him, the idea that, in part at least, our relationship was that of, or his relationship to us was somebody helping us. So when it came to the um, uh, film itself, first of all, I, there was a film which was extraordinary because the beginning part of it had every member of the um, Scorpions uh, being blessed, so they took their berets off and they provided perfect police mugshots of everyone in the unit. Perfect for identification. There's another one of them. Um, so we, we played that bit, unexceptional. Told him a little bit about it. And then I said, um, this video, which is potentially distressing viewing, and I'm only going to play a small part of it, reveals Mr. Savanovich if the evidence is in due course of admitting. That's why I want your assistance. Pressing the point. Reveals that men were brought from Srebrenica in batches to this group of scorpions to be executed. And then I showed him this picture, which is the back of the truck, as the men were brought, and the men were then being horrible, the young men, the boys really, being abused on the ground. And I then said, well, the lorry leaves, the men are eventually taken to the hills, it may be difficult, uh, don't linger on this. Here they are taken to the surrounding countryside. This is all happening in about a minute, or less. I had to get this done before anybody got in my way. Uh, two remain, and then I said, here they are taken to the surrounding countryside, two remaining not shot are untied, I needn't go into the details, they're untied, the two move the four bodies and then they're shot. And Stavanovich now, is, is confused. I see, but I, I, I don't see, or rather, I, I haven't seen any scorpion insignia. Oh, you'd recognise the scorpion insignia, would you, if you saw it? Well, well I think it would be clear. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I assume that it's a picture of a scorpion. Oh, you guessed that, did you? So he was already slightly discombobulated by the speed of what we were up to. Um, and so then we showed the pictures of the killings, which are deeply unpleasant. And sure enough, the interventions that I knew had come would come. K, counsel imposed for the defendant. Oh, this is sensationalism. Well, what's sensational? This is about killing people. It's not sensational to show killing if your case is about killing people. And the judge says, well, there's some merit in that. Uh, who made it? So I steamrolled that. We weren't having any of that nonsense to intervene. And so I said to him, I'm suggesting this film shows scorpions executing prisoners from Srebrenica. So what did he reply? As I'm upset, I, I have to say this is one of the most monstrous images I've ever seen. Of course, I've never seen anything like this. In, in life. I'm astonished that you've played this video in connection with my testimony. Da, 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 da. So, but he was... And then Robinson, the judge, has begun to come on our side. Do you agree? Do you agree with the prosecutor's suggestion that this is a film that shows the 
scorpions executing prisoners? Uh, of course, I, I'm not going to cast doubt on what the prosecutor is saying, says St uh, Stavanovich. And then he's asked, uh, now those photographs I had taken, which were very innocent photographs, just showing people in the mugshots, and I needed identification for the leader of the group and the men who'd done the killing. So I said, is Slobodan Medic there, that he was the leader of the scorpions? Ah, oh, there are two photographs of him. Do you recognise that man? Oh, I only recall the nickname. The, the nickname Botzer is familiar. I, I can't recall his face. I think I saw this man. By dealing with it quickly and knowing where we were going, he actually confessed to knowing that Botzer was a man, the head of this unit, was a man he'd actually met. And Judge Bonamy, the Scottish judge, intervenes. Had I been successful, I, was looking, I only looked this up over the weekend for this lecture, had I been successful in what I'd attempted to do, this was the question from Judge Bonamy that followed shortly afterwards. He says, I think the question was asked because in relation to some of the earlier documents, he's a Scottish judge, by the way, um, <laughs> you made the comment that you would make inquiries. Now, is that not something you can be done in relation to the material that's now being presented to you in this video? Uh, along those lines, of, of course, I, I think I can, and so on. What I was doing um, there was exactly what you do in an ordinary case, but re really large. It all had to be prepared. You had to know exactly where you were going. And I was actually serving an objective broader than just that trial. Uh, although I didn't know it immensely successfully, because that, although we only played a minute to make the point, that night or the following night, somebody in Belgrade who had a full version of the film played it all. And in Serbia, the majority who had thought Srebrenica was propaganda changed. The majority now accepted that Srebrenica was real. And although I can't say it's been entirely a happy um, history since then, there has been a form of apology and a recognition of one thing or another. So this was a great thing to have done. Um, and I uh, am very happy that I was able to bring to this all the skills that really, I suppose, I'd come with, and the ideas I'd come with from England. Of course, <laughs> when I got out, the chief prosecutor and the deputy prosecutor tried to find something to complain of in what I did. Nobody's ever interested in institutions like the UN in uh, what is daring. Right, let's come back to England. For a last point, then a few closing remarks, there may be time for questions, I hope so. Uh, I came back to England, and although I did mostly overseas work, I did one case, long case, lasted about five years off and on, involving the Ministry of Defence. It was a personal injury case. And the, the young man concerned, <coughs> Robert Uren, U-R-E-N, um, had become a paraplegic as a result of playing a game in a fun day at an Air Force base, organised by some event organisers and approved by the Ministry of Defence. And he dived headfirst into a pool with 18 inches of water in it and became paraplegic. The Ministry of Defence and the event organisers denied liability and from the beginning were determined to say that Robert Uren was responsible for his own terrible misfortune. In fact, they knew from the very beginning, from their internal inquiries, that he had done exactly what 50% of the other people had done at the instigation of the event organisers, with their approval, with their encouragement, without any opposition by the Ministry of Defence. Do you remember the case of Barrett? where the Ministry of Defence tried to hide the evidence? Was there any difference here? Unhappily, there was a photograph of the previous heat. And this showed exactly what people were doing, going in head first. Half the people went in in exactly the same way as Robert Uren did. So he was indeed, and they both knew it, both defendants, that he was blameless. 
But that didn't stop them spending an enormous amount of money, all going to lawyers, trying to deny him um, damages, which would make a substantial difference to his life. First of all, they said it was his fault, and then when they realised that they were um, unable to pursue that, they came up with a version that the game was safe. Never been played before. This was the second heat of the game, something like the 30th entry, of which 15 people have gone in headfirst, and he breaks his neck. At the first um, incident, the first trial, there were two trials at huge expense. We had an, a commercial judge sitting on the case. He found the game was safe. Remember the commercial judge sitting in the Court of Appeal in the Barrett case? The Court of Appeal overturned the decision. And we went back before a uh, judge experienced in personal injury litigation and he found for us. And eventually the case came to a reasonably satisfactory conclusion for Robert Ewan, but only after five years, only after being made to think, because he had a bit of amnesia as a result of the accident that he suffered, um, being made to think that he was the author of the terrible things that had happened to him and would, of course, affect him for literally the, the rest of his life. There he is. Now, what I'm going to tell you about, that's the overall story, and these days I think we are allowed to express opinions about cases in which we appear... I express no opinion, save maybe by the tone of my voice. But I thought what you might find interesting was one question in the first trial. It was in the course of the defence case, Sergeant Thomas gave evidence. So he was called by one of the defendants, cross-examined by the other defendant, cross-examined by me, re-examined by his own counsel, and the judge, the commercial judge asked, the commercially experienced judge, asked some questions. Listening to the questions he asked and the answer he got allowed for the possibility that Robert Uren's entry into the pool could have been separated out from all the others, different in quality. If that had happened, it would have been open to the judge he did it by another route, but it might have been open to the judge to find that he was the author of his own misfortune because of his manner of entry. And it's interesting to know that my reaction, which would be the, exactly the same reaction of any other advocate in the same position, if you've been doing the job for some time, and however elegant it might have seemed to somebody in any public gallery, you know you have to fight exactly that moment. Fight or be felled, because if you don't, you may have lost the case for good. And so, in this case, it was pretty obvious what I had to do, and I was able to do it with that perhaps arguably unfair weapon of the leading question that you can apply in cross-examination, forcing down Sergeant Thomas's mouth the words he'd already said to neutralise the effect of the judge's question and answer. And so we were able to defend the position and indeed to use it somewhat in attack on the second trial. But, and that's all I need to say about this case, um, apart from, I suppose, this really by way of closing uh, observations, Many, many cases, and we've seen examples of them in the few examples I've give, given, turn on tiny little points. A question here, the whim of a judge reading his wooden world there, a mistake by counsel. Um, uh, in, uh, I meant to tell you about that case, and I haven't got time now. Um, a mistake I made once in a case, but I will say it, I... I made a little mistake in a case, a fairly little mistake in a case, as a result of which I had about six months of insomnia. 
because I was so worried about what I'd done and that the consequences of it were comparatively slight. And <laughs> um, that's important because the experience of disasters builds in you an ability to face the next one. So the next one comes up, you think, I know what's going to happen in this one. I'm going to suffer another six months of insomnia. But you get out of it at the end, so it doesn't matter. You battle on. So that sort of thing. So these things turn on not a sixpence or the head of a pin, but they turn on very little. And I suppose it is possible to ask the question whether that's the best that we can achieve by our justice systems, or are justice systems all self-defining? He who wins has got a just result. Is that what we must say? I don't know. Uh, what is clear to me is that I've been very, very fortunate in being able to engage in this particular justice system, here and abroad, um, at a time when the system has been uh, capable of providing a lot of interest. But I have to leave it to other people to decide what the value of the systems overall may be. And I'd ask this question, I suppose, at the end, as you look back um, on a reasonably long period of time at the bar. Does it make any difference if you compare the work of a lawyer with, say, the natural scientist, or the intergalactic explorer, or even the engineer? Because they, for the most part, are also problem solvers. But they solve problems set by the goodness of the gods, and we lawyers try to solve problems set by the badness of men. Questions? <laughs>